as the body of Christ, let us say together our covenant. We who are called of God into this Christian community, covenant together, seek to know the will of God, to experience the joy and struggle of discipleship, to proclaim in word and deed the love of Christ, and to work for peace and justice among all people. We trust God's promise of grace and forgiveness and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our trials and rejoicing. setting things up. I don't know if there are any children present or if there are just some that would enjoy taking a look at a comic book, but um, what I know is that I have a friend, uh, actually a colleague, who has uh, put together a thing which he calls a cartoonist guide to the Bible. He's a Lutheran pastor and his name is Steve Thomason. And for the last few years, he has been uh, putting together Bible stories, uh, finding ways in order to be able to tell Bible stories uh, that are creative and, and wonderful. And he has taken the scripture reading that we have for today, uh, Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 15, and uh, has made it into a bit of a cartoon. So. Uh, what I'd like to do is to walk with you through this story. It's a story about Sarah and Abraham. And uh, you can see them, if I get this slide to advance, you can see them right here. And um, Sarah is the lady inside the tent right here. And it come and stopped by their camp. They, they uh, were wanderers, they were nomads, and they had uh, sheep and uh, cattle and donkeys and all different sorts of, of uh, animals that they, that they kept with them. And lots of people that lived with them to help take care of them. And they were very old. Um, you may know that uh, Abraham, by the time this story is told, is 98 years old, and that Sarah is 89, and that they had hoped for all of their uh, adult lives, ever since they'd gotten married, that they might be able to have children. And they weren't. They, it just never happened for them. And so they'd given up hope on the idea of having any children. And um, then one day, uh, although God had promised uh, Abraham in a, in a bunch of different visions, had told Abraham that they would have lots of children. They would have as many children as there were stars in the sky. Uh, there would be as many children as there were grains of sand in the desert there would be as many children as they could possibly imagine. Um, but no, they didn't have 
many, not together. So in the heat of the day, he looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. My Lord, if I find favor with you, he said, do not pass by your servant. Let, your, let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. The three visitors said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah, and he said to her, make ready quickly, three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. So each one of these guys was going to get a cake. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds of milk and the calf that he had prepared, and he set it before the visitors, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. The visitors, as they were eating, said, where is your wife, Sarah? Abraham said, there in the tent. One of the visitors said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of children. So Sarah laughed to herself. After I have grown old, she thought, and my husband is so old, shall I have pleasure? Why did Sarah laugh, one of them said, and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. Sarah said, I did not laugh. The visitor said, oh, yes, you did laugh. Well, that's the story of Abraham and Sarah and the three visitors that came to see them there by the Oaks of Mamre. Um, it reminds us of some rather crazy things. And I wanna talk with the grownups about this in a little while uh, in my sermon, but I want for all of you to know, you young people and you old people alike, that though we may think that God has given up on us, and we may imagine that God just maybe doesn't like us anymore or isn't going to come through. This story tells us God will be with us. God hears our prayers and cares about us. So if you have things that you're waiting for in hope, I hope that you get them. I encourage you to be praying about them and um, to be talking with God more about what you should be able to expect. Because as they said in this story, nothing shall be impossible for God. Let us pray. Dear God, you challenge us to believe in you because so often it can seem as though we're waiting and waiting and there's just nothing going to happen. Nothing's going to change. Change us, oh God. Help us to change our expectations of the world so that what you want, what we want, can come true. Let this be your good news. In Jesus' name, amen. From the writings, 
Psalm 6. To the leader with stringed instruments, according to the Shemineth, a Psalm of David. O oh God, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Instead, be gracious to me, for I'm languishing. O oh God, heal me, for my bones are shaking with terror. My soul is also struck with terror, while you, O oh God, how long? Turn, O oh God, save my life. Deliver me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death, there is no remembrance of you. In Shul, who can give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night, I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eyes waste away because of grief. They grow weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For my God has heard the sound of my weeping. My God has heard the, my supplication. My God accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and struck with terror. They shall turn back and in a moment be put to shame. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the people. Thanks be to God.
Dear God, the world is a challenging place right now. And we pray for your inspiration and guidance as we seek to know in you who and how you call us to be your people, Christ's body, enlivened by your spirit. Amen. So um, those of you who have uh, read Genesis before will know that that portion that I read of chapter 18 actually is answered in chapter 21. And and, and chapter 21, that laughter that had started with Sarah um, out of despair, out of, out of just, I, I, I don't think even it was despair by that time. I think it was just her figuring that life was always going to be the way that it was. And so why hope for anything more? But uh, she did become pregnant and she did have that child and um, because perhaps of the laughter that she and Abraham had been doing when it was told to them, oh yes, by next year, you're going to have a baby. They named the baby Isaac, laughter. Now, why did I choose the readings we've shared today? I, Psalm six, which is just so depressing. And um, then uh, Genesis 18, which is sort of transitioning into hopefulness and, and Genesis 21, which uh, brings people to a point where they're actually laughing. Um, why did I choose these? Um, well, honestly, our course of scriptures includes the reading about Sarah and Abraham learning to laugh again after lifetimes of struggle and disappointment, even while they were enjoying what in their day passed for financial success. God made promises to them as far as they were concerned that God had not kept. What's the point of having all this wealth, Abraham wondered, if I can't share it with my children? And I know children don't have to be the end all and be all of one's existence, but that's what these two had hoped for and something about their reproductive life had prevented it. Then, just when they had gotten pretty used to the disappointment and probably had stopped asking, like the psalmist would write thousands of years later, how long, O oh God, must I wait for your restoration? The answer came. And the answer came so late that Sarah did laugh. Shall I have pleasure even in my old age? She asked. The word in Hebrew, pleasure, doesn't look, by the way, as though she's laughing at the thought of having a baby. She's laughing at the thought of spending, shall we say, productive time when, what, when younger she would have hoped would be reproductive time also with her very old husband. She just found it funny. So when they did have a child, they named the boy Laughter. That's what roughly Isaac means in Hebrew. When shall we know pleasure again? as a community, we're wondering. I'm not talking about sex now, by the way. I'm just saying we want to move from how long, O oh Lord, to actually rejoicing, singing, and laughing, and shouting, and sharing again, together again. As we have pondered how we shall be restored to community, at least among the church staff, it's gone through a number of changes. For the first few weeks, we thought it would be triumphant restoration to activity as it was. Tracy will remember that we left the sanctuary during Lent, hoping that we'd be back for Palm Sunday, you know, with the donkey and everything, and then Easter with all of its loud exuberance. And then when Easter wasn't proving to be possible, we imagined we'd celebrate anyway, as if it was Easter. But the scenarios we're imagining, it turned out, we were imagining, were exactly the scenarios that would cause a resurgence of the outbreak. Gathering in large numbers and singing and shouting, scattering and gathering Easter eggs and consuming even small quantities of food in numbers together, you, you just can't do that 
way too much aerosolization of the virus and communal contact of surfaces. We would have to be much more contemplative in our approach, we concluded. This is going to be a slow reawakening rather than a sudden escalation. I'm taking you on a weeks long journey through our phased reopening process with this series of sermons I'm preaching this month because I'm finding it to be something like the ways in which we recover from almost any struggle and ways in which we find ourselves redeemed in our spiritual existence when we approach that existence with intentionality. We're having to wait and wait. I propose to you this morning that despite our theologically liberal credentials, there is nevertheless something traditional about the way in which we encounter our religious life. We may recognize intellectually and religiously that we as a community have an obligation to renew the creation with our creator. We may understand that we have to be, as Isaiah would put it, repairers of the breach. We know that the world cannot afford to stay the way that it is and that our God calls us, demands of us, that we be the bringers of the change. But I'll tell you something that maybe we've forgotten or maybe we've been intimidated out of realizing us liberal theologians that we are. We cannot be bringers of the change, uh, repairers of the breach, renewers of the creation our God has made unless, unless we are ready to work on ourselves. Our God is saying we are needed in this time and just about any time, but we're going to be of no use to anyone unless we are ready to work on ourselves. One of the sobering things about the coronavirus pandemic, for me at least, has been the way in which all of our usual problems and challenges haven't gone away. Environmental destruction, rampant poverty, abuse of power, LGBTQ plus phobias and discrimination, sexism, police violence out of all proportion to the crimes committed, and racism. And the past couple of weeks have concentrated us strongly on that last two but especially that last one. And it feels this time as though maybe our society, trying to fight off disease the way that we are, we're just sick enough of COVID-19 that we know we won't get genuinely well unless we as a society engage these other matters. What do you think? Well, whatever you think. What I've been hearing this week from people I trust, has inclined me to consider what it will mean for us as we phase back into activity at First Church. If phase one includes our acceptance that there has to be a new spirited way of being for us, the way we talked about it on Pentecost, and phase two moves us from the spirit, the Holy Spirit, to an understanding of what our sacred space shall be, I mean in particular, is worship important enough to us that we can find ourselves as gratified to praise God in Memorial Hall as we might in our sanctuary? I mean, that is one of our possibilities when we get back. Or have we become idolaters of sacred space and it has to be the sanctuary? That may not have been what you heard me asking about last week, but that's part of what I meant when I was talking about trying to understand that all spaces are sacred. Well then, phase three. When we actually are able to gather, at least in small numbers, in some space, and this worship, whether it is in Memorial Hall or the sanctuary or anywhere else for that matter, what will make our efforts genuinely meaningful? How shall our restoration of community be a restoration of meaning and purposefulness? God's love and justice are going to demand a lot of us. And sometimes all we want is to be able to pay someone else to do the challenging work, you know? The good news is supposed to liberate spirits, not repress them though. Spiritual discipline is something that is intended to lead one to newfound heights and possibilities, not to crush one under the weight of authority and restriction, but conformity and a resistance to activity that leads to change for those who need to change, these have been the ways that we have to admit we've followed. 
probably the most profound thing I heard this week was the statement by Hickson Middle School's new principal, Dr. Shanita Mays, that not a racist, as in the oft-repeated white people's defensive reaction, but I'm not a racist, am I? Is not the opposite of being racist. I'm not a racist. It's not the opposite of being racist. Anti-racist is the opposite of being racist. Just accepting people for who they are is not enough. Letting other people be is not okay. Because prejudice and discrimination are things. And the stereotypes and suspicions that are so rife in our society are contagious enough for all of us that we will constantly have it demanded of us. That we do the work. That we believe the people who are being mistreated. And that we not dismiss their complaints or, or fail to take them seriously. And when people who have become infected with the contagion of racism insist that they ought to be able to continue and spread their sickness, we must speak up because that will be the first step towards their healing. Then a few nights ago, one of my colleagues, and I'll tell you, it's Stephanie Leonard, it's the pastor at Unity United Methodist Church. She mentioned in our clergy group that heaven is an anti-racist reality. And incidentally, earth should be too. And she defined for me in a moment the most profound meaning I think our faith community might find, and we as individuals might hope to find, as we seek to defeat the contagion of coronavirus too. Getting away from our building for a time and doing this sort of thing, this sort of worship that seeks what it really means to praise God as individuals and community. You know, why do we want to praise God? We have to wonder, what is it that God has done for me that has brought me to conclude that I want to keep doing this? These are the things we are brought to consider in our isolation so that when we get back together again, even in small numbers, we can be meaning-filled people reestablishing meaningful community. It's not gonna be a big Easter thing that we can do once we're back in our spaces, whether Memorial Hall or the sanctuary or any other space in the behemoth of a building we share. We'll be reserving seats and restricting passage in and out. It's just going to be a whole lot subtler a restoration than we had hoped or than we would like to imagine. And challengingly, the world is nevertheless going to continue to demand of us that we not be on some trailing edge of change the way the church has so often been throughout its history. Nor will it be acceptable for us to make timid steps forward in support of those who need our privilege and our power to be exploited to their advantage racism and police violence committed and, and sexism and discrimination and phobias that victimize LGBTQ plus people and abuse of power and rampant poverty and destruction of the environment, all of those things that I mentioned before, those are not things that a people who adore a God of love and justice can afford to ignore or to take lightly. If we are going to be able to behave again on Sundays like the meaningful community we know we are during the other days of our lives, then now is the time for us to be filling our personal living with meaning and purpose. And it will become challenging and it will become tedious, and it will seem as though we are never going to get there, but I promise at the end, God's promises do eventually make their way out. And for as much struggle as we are doing now, there will be a time when with our siblings all over the world, but especially nearby, we will rejoice and we will 
shout and we will sing and we will laugh. Oh, how we will laugh. But for now, get reading, get meeting, get marching. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us remember today these people and situations for whom we are praying. Yeah, join me in an attitude of prayer. We lift our joys and concerns today. We have Joyce, Paul, Margaret, Carol, Bob, Ken, Becky, Clarine, who's the mother of Eric Falconer and Taylor Levis, who is Herb's granddaughter, who was hit by a car last night. Her person was, and she is currently at the hospital. Those who are worried about their business or their unemployment or their employment, young people and their teachers studying and teaching remotely, those lonely and alone, people with stressed home situations intensified by quarantine, first responders, healthcare workers, delivery personnel, protesters, and police. And now, Dave, I'll give it to you. We remember also people of color who deal with anxiety every day, uh, the stress of, of living from one day to the next. Um, there was a, a, prayer of, uh, a prayer of gratitude to God for the curse and the blessing of technology, which came earlier. Um, and we're experiencing a little bit of that right now. Let me see if I can get us back to where we're supposed to be. There we are. <laughs> Prayers for those dealing with mental and physical ailments during periods of self-isolation. And those are our prayers that we've listed from chat. Let us continue in an attitude of prayer. God, you are calling us to newness and meaning, not only to be filled full of your spirit's wisdom and understanding, but to live into the fullness of your meaning so that we may love as you do and that we may seek to establish justice as you do and no hope as you do. So turn us inward that our outward lives may reflect the one we meet there. Enliven us with the life and hope of Christ. Let none of us be so stuck in our familiar ways that our hearts cannot be changed and keep changing. 
Help us to know your hope for us so that we may have hope for ourselves, our neighbors, our siblings, and our world. And in this Pride Month, keep us true to our open and affirming statement and to our covenant that indeed, no matter who anyone is that comes to us or where they are on life's journey, that they, as we have found for ourselves, might be welcome into our community. All of this we pray in the name of the one who came to us and taught us that we are your children, just as he is, and that we might say with boldness and confidence the prayer which he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The benediction for this morning is uh, actually the words of a song, a translation into English from the Spanish, uh, the song which in English means sent out in Jesus' name. Sent out in Jesus' name, our hands are ready now to make the earth a place in which God's realm may come. The angels cannot change a world of hurt and pain into a world of love, of justice, and of peace. The task is ours to do, to set it really free. Oh, help us to obey and carry out your will. You are sent forth in Jesus' name. Be ready to laugh, to rejoice, to dance, and to shout. When the time comes that we can actually do that together. Peace be upon you. That's our worship for this Sunday at First Church. We won't be collecting offerings during our worship services until after a vaccine is found for the novel coronavirus. So if you would like to support First Church with a financial donation, and you're able to,
Please send a check to First Congregational Church, 10 West Lockwood, Webster Groves, Missouri, 63119. Or go to our website, firstchurchwg.org, and go to our donate page. Church members, please note that we will be conducting an election on June 28th for our congregation's leaders, following worship on that day. The slate of candidates was included in this week's e-news. Printed ballots also will be sent through the Postal Service to those who receive most of their communications from the church by mail. Voting can take place either in advance with that paper ballot or by email, sending it back to the church, or else by a show of hands using the Zoom platform on June the 28th. Thanks for sharing time with us today. Our worship has ended. Let our service begin.